Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an enriching top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 sweet secrets that will enrich your marriage. Anyone who has been married even for a little while knows both how challenging and rewarding a marriage can be. Because marriage was God's idea. Because it is the building block for the family and society. And because it is a graphic illustration of Christ and his church. And the devil has made it a target for his attacks. Here are simple but effective tips to undergoing and overcoming. And so here we go with our... 10 sweet little secrets to enrich your marriage. Number one, learn to leave and cleave. These verses, of course, come from the very beginning when God established marriage. And what happens is that a man becomes a new head and uh, two become one. The wife must know that on earth, she is the first loyalty of her husband. Now, this was something I had to learn the hard way. Uh, my idea was, look, you know, my family and you are sort of on equal terms, and we don't have to have some sort of competitive thing where you have to be first over them. We can all be first together. That's not true. Uh, the wife needs to know that she is one with her husband. He is not one with his parents. He is one with her. And so you don't give away the groom. I had to give away five daughters in marriage. The son becomes the head of the new home, whereas the daughter is being given to be under his headship. And that's a difficult thing for a father to do. We read in Genesis 5, 2, God called their name Adam. And the idea is the reason that a woman takes her husband's name starts right there at the beginning because God sees them as one creative act. He didn't make the woman independent of the man. She came out of the man so he could say, she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And so she's there, so to speak, at his side to remind him that she is to be protected and cared for and that his first loyalty on earth is to his wife. And so he is to leave his father and mother and to cleave only to his wife. If we were to do that in practical terms, when a discussion comes up about what your mother said or what your father said, to reaffirm, you know, my first loyalty is to you. Now, it doesn't mean I always agree with my wife and disagree with my parents but she knows that my first loyalty is to my wife. It's one of the most essential truths in the scripture, beginning at the very root of marriage, and it produces the sweet fruit of trust and dependency and cooperation that comes from simple obedience to that principle in the Word of God. Number two, realize commitment is the fence around love's garden. This is a common misunderstanding that love is what holds a marriage together. Love waxes and wanes, unfortunately, when it comes to human love. Loyalty should be the constant. So loyalty is the fence that keeps us in the marriage. Love is the tender little plant that grows. We need to water and care for love. We need to invest in it. If we don't invest in our marriage, if we don't invest in love in our relationship, then it begins to wilt and fade. And so in the marriage, God's honor is at stake. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So God attends every wedding and he puts the link. He makes us one. This is a supernatural act of God. And so we need to take our marriage seriously. This isn't something we decided to do. God puts us together. And sometimes a man will say, I think I married the wrong woman. Well, she may have been the wrong woman the night before, but today at the marriage, you said yes, and now she is the right one. 
and God will give you the grace to grow together in that little fence of commitment. We need to be committed, first of all, to God, because this is where the man, the woman, and God have made a threefold covenant, the threefold cord that is not easily broken. And God's honor is at stake here, and we need to take that very seriously. Number three, remember that submission is a two-way street. In Ephesians 5.21, before we read that wives submit to their husbands, the verse says we are to submit to one another in the fear of God. So the wife follows Christ in submitting to her equal, the way Christ submitted to his father. But the husband follows Christ in giving himself in sacrifice for his bride. So Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The idea that the man is somehow the big cheese in the relationship completely misses the point. Christ humbled himself and gave himself for the church. And when a husband is willing to give himself for the wife, she will prove her love and loyalty to him. If he expects her to be the servant in the relationship, he's got the whole thing upside down. Number four, follow the minus two plus two rule every day. Now, what does that mean? Well, Ephesians 4, 31, 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's the minus two. And... He goes on to say, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's the plus two rule. So to me, the difference in a marriage is if every day there are two things that I could say that I don't say. In other words, my wife did something and I'm just waiting for a slam dunk. I'm waiting to get back, to get even. She hurt me, I'm going to make sure she hurts, or vice versa, right? I just decide, no, I'm not going to do that. And on the other hand, two things positively that I don't necessarily have to say, that I go out of my way to say. You're looking beautiful today. Thank you for that delicious meal. Thank you for all the meals you've cooked for me over the years. Going out of my way to say something positive going out of my way not to say something negative. Even a couple of times a day, if I practice that, it will certainly enrich my life and our marriage in the process. Number five, take life seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> right, right. First Peter 1.13, be sober and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, be sober, be serious. We need to be serious about life. Life is serious. Marriage is serious. Family is serious. There are lots of things that are serious. Sometimes men don't grow up. They end up being the wife's other child, and they want their wife to be like their mother, to do their laundry and cook their meals and then leave them alone so they can act like overgrown teenagers who go out and spend time with the boys. Get serious about life. That's a very important truth. But don't take yourself so seriously. People say, I can't believe they said that about me. Well, they could have said a lot worse than been telling the truth. I'm just a poor rotten sinner. It's only the grace of God that he's made anything out of me at all. So when people say something and say, oh, I'm so deeply offended at this. This is the number one cause of difficulty in marriages, in churches, in families. I'm offended. I felt like I was put down. Well, look, if you want to go down, then that's the right way to go, isn't it? Anything that humbles us is good for us. And so that's what I mean when I say take life seriously. Don't take yourself so seriously. And people spend half their life offended at what people said about them. Well, as I say, they could have said something a lot worse than been telling the truth. So take life seriously, but don't take yourself so seriously. And if you do, learn to laugh at yourself. Learn to laugh at your foibles and failures. And if you do, laughter is the best medicine. It'll help you overcome these things. It doesn't mean that we don't take it seriously. If my wife points something out to me and I laugh it off, that's not a good thing. 
but certainly I should learn to laugh at myself and not feel like, you know, I'm perfect and anything short of that is obviously a misreading of, of uh, reality, right? Learn to realize that I fail and get over it. Get over myself. And then number six, invite Jesus into every serious discussion. Now, we often quote a verse where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst, as if that's a description of the church. And I'm not sure it exactly is. What Jesus is talking about is two people getting together to discuss an issue, a problem between them. And he's saying, if you're going to do that, I'll be there. But we need to recognize that he's there. So before I talk to my wife about something serious, whether I do it audibly or not, I always go to Jesus and say, please don't let me say anything that you wouldn't say. Because I'm really bad at relationships and I say the wrong thing all the time. So I just say, Lord, set a guard at my lips. Don't let me say something that's out of line, that's unfeeling, that's going to hurt her. She'll take the wrong way. And so if we bring Jesus into it and acknowledge I don't want my way. I don't want your way. We want Jesus' way together. We're both trying to come to the same way, and that way is Jesus' way. If that's the attitude, every, every conversation, every disagreement, every difficulty, we may not always come to a good resolution, but we'll have a good attitude about it, and that makes a lot of difference. Number seven, give each other the benefit of the doubt. I like the little boy who would say when he heard something negative about one of his friends, maybe taint so, right? No evil suspicions. There's a tendency sometimes, when we've had difficulty in a marriage, bitterness springs up. And it's not too long until I don't like the way he combs his hair, I don't like the way he drives his car. It doesn't matter what it is, I don't like his jokes. And what's happened is, I have allowed bitterness at the spring of my being to jaundice everything in life. Everything becomes a bitter experience. That's a sad way to get. So I think here we want to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 to 7 says, love thinks no evil. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So I take this attitude like, well, maybe they didn't mean that. Instead of looking for hidden meanings, negative meanings in everything a person says, say like, you know, hope you have a great day. Well, what? Did I give you a rough day yesterday? Well, no, I just thought it'd be nice for you to have a good day today. So what was wrong with yesterday? You know? So once we get into this attitude, where we're looking for the negative side, we walk on the shadow side of life and everything becomes a conspiracy against me. That's a really nasty way to live. So give people the benefit of the doubt, assume they think the best, assume they want the best, hope for the best, and life will be a lot sweeter. Number eight, be quick to confess and know what it means to forgive. Colossians 3, 12 to 14, put on tender mercies, kindness. Notice that, put on. It's like I'm getting dressed in the morning and I'm putting these things on. I'm consciously, intentionally saying, I want to be tender and kind and humble and meek and long-suffering. I want to bear with this person and forgive this person. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do but above all these things put on love. So love's the overcoat that I wear. And when people interact with me, that should be my first response to them is to show love. I had a missionary doctor friend. He had to leave the mission field and come home. He was so grieved at all his Christian friends getting divorced. And he started a clinic for Christian couples in the city of Toronto. And he was at a conference giving a seminar on marriage and I wanted to go and hear it, but unfortunately I had a seminar at the same time. I spoke to him about this and he said, well, Jabe, really one Bible verse would solve 95% of Christian marriage problems. It was James 5.16, which says, 
Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Just be honest with each other and compensate for the other person's difficulties and weaknesses by not complaining about it, not criticizing it, but praying. Turn your complaints into prayers. Take them to the Lord. The Lord can change their heart. I can't change your heart. I can't even change my own heart. I need the Lord to help me. So when I see difficulties, I can take them to the Lord and the Lord can change their heart. And so I need to be quick to confess my faults and not always justify myself. It's a wicked thing to spend my life trying to justify things instead of saying, you're right, I'm sorry. The other thing is knowing what it means to forgive. To forgive means I'm willing to take the damages. If you drive my car into a pole and I say, I forgive you, that means I'm not pretending nothing happened. I'm just agreeing that I'll cover the cost. So if somebody says something against me in a crowd, and then they come to me privately and say, will you forgive me? I have to decide, are they going to pay for it or am I going to pay for it? If they're going to pay for it, then every opportunity I get, I tell everybody I know, you remember when they said that to me? Well, they came crawling on their hands and knees and I'm making them pay for it. But if I say I'll pay for it, that means I put it in the back file and I never pull it out again. This idea like I do something, oh, I go through the file, you did this on January 6, 1947 and 1963 and here it is and I keep records. Love keeps no record of wrongs and forgiveness means like God, I put it into the sea of my forgetfulness. I distinctly remember forgetting that. I determined never to bring it up again. That's one of the keys to a happy marriage. Number nine, never go to bed angry. There are two kinds of people. There are some people who blow up and some people who clam up. Okay? There are people who like, ooh, as soon as it happens, they, they wear their heart on their sleeve. There are other people and they store it up inside until eventually the volcano explodes and it gets real nasty. The scripture says, be angry and do not sin. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. So these are the two groups of people. People who are quickly angry and in the process commit sin by being rash and hasty and saying things they shouldn't say and so on. And then there are other people who let the sun go down on their wrath. They simmer. Right? He says, don't do either. There is a time to be angry, but to be angry about the right thing in the right way with the right attitude, that takes real grace. We usually get angry with the sinner instead of with the sin. And God gets angry with the sin, not with the sinner. So learning how to be angry correctly is a real art. But he says here, don't sin by losing your temper and don't sin by storing it up. That's how malice and hatred and bitterness develop. Let not the sun go down in your wrath. Is a story told about one man who had been hurt by another man in the city of London. And as evening progressed, he sent a little note over to the other brother and all it said was, oh brother, the sun is going down. And the man hastened to his home to apologize and set the thing right. If we would practice this in our marriage, have no outstanding accounts, before we go to bed at night, we've got the thing clear. It's a much happier way to face life. Now, it may be that there's some very complicated thing and we say, look, let's do this tomorrow morning, but let's, let's agree that everything is going to be settled in the morning. There are some things that need to be talked about in daylight and not in the middle of night when the person's exhausted. I agree. But just the same, the principle is we don't let things carry on and simmer and rot within us. That's for sure. Lastly, number 10, pray lavish prayers for each other. This is better than an expensive vacation, better than fancy jewelry. I can afford to do this. To think about my wife, my husband, as a precious investment that I'm investing in their lives, investing time, investing care, concern. I want to share their life with them. And so one of the best things I can do is to 
see the person that I'm spending the most time with enriched by the Lord. And so to pray those kinds of prayers for them. In Ephesians 3, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, asking that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. If we would take that prayer and say, I'm going to pray this for my partner. I'm going to pray that, that they might, according to the riches of his glory, be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man. Wow. You know, these are, these are pre-approved prayers. We know these exactly match the will of God. And so to begin to pray these generous, these lavish prayers for each other, and to see God answering those prayers in each other, it's one of the best things we can do. Because God can reach where I can't reach. He can touch their heart and conscience, where all I am is frustrated. I want to change this person. I can't even change me. But the Spirit of God can do it. And so to pray lavish prayers on my husband or my wife is one of the best things I can do for our marriage. Now, I don't have all the answers. I haven't even been married 50 years yet. I still have questions, but I do know these principles, many of them I have first round failed at and had to learn the hard way. But these are the kinds of things that I believe make a marriage rich and lasting and fruitful and mutually beneficial and glorifying to the Lord and are a reflection to the children as they see the marriage. They themselves want to have that kind of marriage themselves and come to discover what God the Father is like and through the mother they see the heart of God manifested in the daily experience. So there's nothing better than a good marriage and a healthy family to reveal God to society at large and to the church that God would help us to realize how precious and how valuable a marriage is. It's made in heaven, it's sustained by God, and it's designed to reflect Christ to a watching world. So you couldn't think of anything better than ways to enrich a marriage.